you for coming out this morning. My name is Ken Konka. I'm a member of the faculty here in the School of International Service. I'm affiliated with the Global Environmental Politics Program, which uh, sponsors this practicum, and also with the uh, International Peace and Conflict Resolution uh, Program. And so it's great to see this project, which really sits at the intersections of the themes of environment uh, and, and, and peace building. So I'd like to welcome you to the presentation of the practicum team on Building Bridges Over Troubled Waters, an analysis of Palestinian-Israeli cooperation within the food, water, energy nexus in the West Bank. Is that what it says on the screen as well? Yeah. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. We're off to a good start. So today we're going to hear a presentation by the graduate student team uh, here in SIS that uh, produced uh, this uh, research project. And I'd like to just give you a little bit of context uh, and thank a few of our partners, and then we'll be uh, turning it over fairly quickly. Uh, uh, so what a practicum is. So master students in the School of International Service have, as one of their uh, degree requirements, uh, the completion of a capstone research project. And while some of the students will do a substantial research paper individually working with a faculty member, we also have a team practicum option uh, for our students. Uh, a practicum uh, in any capstone research is meant to synthesize the learning and the skill development that the students have been doing over the course of their two-year program with us, and it also aspires to do research that is policy relevant. Uh, practicum is a team research project, and so the students are building skills in collaboration, team research, communication, and conflict resolution at the same time that they're working on a substantive puzzle. Um, and it's always done in the context with a partner organization. So the Global Environmental Politics Program over its history has done uh, practicum uh, collaborations with uh, entities as varied as the U.S. Department of State, the World Resources Institute, uh, grassroots farm justice organizations around the United States, the government of Washington, D.C., and the American University Campus Office of Sustainability. In this case, our partners are an Israeli and Palestinian, uh, two, Israel, two civil society organizations, one Israeli and one Palestinian, the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies in Israel and the Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group. Uh, and these two organizations have been working together for some time now on trying to develop sustainable solutions around food, water, and energy challenges in the region. Uh, at the same time that they work on those projects, they're also, of course, demonstrating that Israelis and Palestinians can work together uh, across uh, the, the conflict uh, divide and to produce sustainable and equitable uh, solutions to the challenges facing everyone in the region. And so in this sense, while they don't necessarily always describe their work as being peace building uh, in nature, to us it's always been an interesting question as to what the peace building effects of such collaboration might be. We have been uh, working with Arva and PWEG uh, for six years now, and it's been quite, we've now sent several student teams, I believe this is the fifth uh, student team that we have sent uh, to the region to work with them, and it's become a very rich partnership, I think, between the collaborating organizations and between American University and the organizations. We've been watching over the past six years as they have deepened their cooperation uh, with one another, and as they have increased the ambition of their collaboration. We started with them when they were working on household scale uh, back backyard uh, gray water recycling projects, uh, primarily in the West Bank. Um, and as you will see today, they have scaled up and scaled out their cooperation over that period to tackle some much more challenging issues. Uh, in this case, around uh, agricultural solar energy use and water recycling uh, knowledge exchange between Israeli and Palestinian farmers and the institutionalization of a joint collaborative venture between Israeli and Palestinian uh, 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 day farmers. And the students will be telling you, I think, a very interesting story this morning about what kinds of expectations do the partners to this collaboration bring to the table? What are they hoping to get about it, out of it? What are the barriers to cooperating? What are the challenges of doing this kind of cooperative work? in the context of, of a very challenging and in many ways one could argue worsening uh, conflict setting. So it's been very exciting for us to be able to be on board with this and we're really pleased with the 
the work that the team has produced uh, this time around. Uh, and I think you'll find it quite fascinating uh, in just a moment. I will say there is a report, and it is available for people who are interested. Uh, it, it, it's challenging in this day and age to make all of our materials uh, compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and so we need to do some more work on the report before we can put it on the American University website, because we do strive to be compliant and be fully accessible and inclusive in everything that we do. So at the end of the presentation, there will be an email address, and anyone who's interested, just shoot us an email at that address, and we'll make sure that you get the report, and we would welcome your feedback and your comments on it. I'd like to take just a moment to thank the various partners and the people who've helped us uh, make this possible so the students can get straight to the substance. The Global Environmental Politics uh, Program here at, uh, within SIS, uh, Universalia Management Group, and my colleague Eric Abitbal, who's the sort of lead instructor on this project and without whom this thing simply would not exist. Eric will say a few words in just a moment. Uh, the, uh, here within the School of International Service, the Office of International Programs and the Practicum Program, which really help us with some of the funding and the logistics that allows us to get our team uh, to the region. The partners themselves, of course, the Arva Institute and PWEG, the Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group, about which you're going to hear quite a bit more uh, in just a moment. Uh, and one partner in particular that I want to set out, single out is the Center for Israel Studies, which is on campus, which is really a, a unique uh, entity uh, here on campus and I think in the scholarly world that has sort of seen the potential and the power of this project from the beginning, uh, supported us. Uh, we wouldn't be having this event this morning without their help uh, and without their support. And so I wanted to invite Laura Cutler from the center to just step up for a moment and say just a word or two. Uh, we'll then hear from Eric and then we'll turn to the students. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Laura Cutler, the Managing Director of the Center for Israel Studies. We've been happy to partner on this project since the very beginning. The Center for Israel Studies is an interdisciplinary program on campus. So we study all different aspects of the modern state of Israel. That's only um, the last 70 years or so. Um, we study music, literature, dance, etc. cetera. Um, but we are also an independent research center. And what's the most exciting about the work we can do, and it doesn't happen all that often, and I want to single out this program, is when you're actually creating research and you're actually contributing to the, the subject of knowledge, um, and in this case, around both environmental peace building um, and uh, innovation. So Israel's a big um, technology innovator, even in the water sphere, but also because it is in a political conflict zone, it brings peace building into it. So um, I'm also most anxious to hear from the students. So I want to thank you all. I want to invite you to sign up to be um, informed about any future events we have. And thank you so much. And um, the final thing is I want to say is there's no faculty that I enjoy working with more than the global environmental politics faculty, Ken and um, Eric. So it's always great to see you. So, bienvenue à Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here, and to be um, well to be here with students, to be here with all of you. And, um, you know, and to uh, create this opportunity, really, and be part of this opportunity to reflect a little bit on Israeli and Palestinian uh, cooperation in the, uh, in the field of environmental peace building, looking at water, food, energy, um, issues in a, in a troubled region, and in a region where, you know, this is a, uh, it's challenging for Israelis and Palestinians to, uh, to work together. Um, there are many obstacles to that cooperation. Um, and at the same time, there are people who, uh, who do it, and there are people who engage with um, one another despite the obstacles and with a hope, uh, a hope for um, a cleaner environment, with a hope for um, having relationships with the other that are different than some of the prescribed relationships of the conflict and of the conflict history. So we're here to talk a little bit and learn a little bit about uh, that cooperation and of the way in which our students have engaged with uh, that cooperation uh, this year. And as part of uh, 
kind of an ongoing cooperation over, uh, over several years, as Ken was saying. This program has been going on since uh, the first report was released in 2013. So we started working on that in 2012. It seems like quite some time ago. And, and many reports have built one on the other over, uh, over the years. So this Israeli-Palestinian cooperation, um, it's, not, it's not very popular today. It's a very difficult time for Israeli-Palestinian cooperation. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a time where, and we just heard, you know, in the last uh, 24, 48 hours, escalations uh, in Gaza. Um, we hear again about the obstacles to, you know, cross borders that people live uh, every day. And some of those borders are physical borders, and some of those borders are psychic and uh, emotional borders. Um, but, you know, this, uh, this cooperation of the Arava Institute and uh, the Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group and the work that our students are doing are situated within a tradition that goes back. It goes back 40, 50 years. Um, I sat with a prominent uh, Palestinian family in Jericho um, some 10 years ago. And I sat with one of the elders in the family who said to me, oh, you know, you, why are you here? You know, um, you're Israeli, you're Canadian, you speak Hebrew, um, you're in Jericho. Why are, you, why are you here? What brings you here? And so we had this long conversation about it. And he said, you know, he said, we used to sit with Israelis like this. He said, we did when we were uh, part of the Palestinian Communist Party in the 60s. He said, you know, where we all believed together that there was a future we could build. He said, you know, and then beyond that conversation, I sat with people in the, you know, the epistemic communities, the scientists um, who sat together and worked together um, beyond the confines of the, the political systems that kept them apart. And again, this is part of that tradition. Um, those who crafted Oslo for all of its strengths and its limitations um, with, uh, you know, again, the scientists and the activists and the politicians and the people who in everyday life started to engage with one another. Um, as we know, since the Second Intifada and since the end of Oslo in 2001, essentially, um, that cooperation has become uh, very difficult. But as I say, it goes on, and um, the Arva Institute and the Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group are doing this, and they're doing this publicly. You know, they're not people who you know run through the streets and advertise their work very publicly and very aggressively, because you know, in the region, you have to navigate between you know being public and inspiring others, and being discreet and being able to continue the work that you're doing. Um, so, you know, our students here are part of documenting um, from a critical perspective, and you'll hear some critical words from them about what they're doing, and from uh, an appreciative and appreciable perspective in ways that speak to, um, you know, an appreciation for what they're doing and all of this in a way that is theoretically informed and in a way that, you know, reflects the, the deep engagement that they have had with Israelis and Palestinians, um, with people in the water sector, with farmers, um, with the whole constellation of people, and they'll tell you that story. So um, I'm certainly proud to be a part of this, to work with Ken, um, to, uh, to work with Laura, to be supported by the university and the Center for Israel Studies and the Office of International Programs and Global Environmental Politics, and, um, you know, and, uh, and to just be a part of of this and thinking about it and supporting it and working um, with all of these people who uh, step outside of the confines of a system that makes this type of cooperation unpopular and difficult. So, um, you know, I turn over the, uh, the microphone to our students who uh, I think have done some very interesting work. Um, so please, uh, you know, join me in uh, welcoming the uh, 2018 environmental Peace Building uh, Practicum Group. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Eric. Thanks, Ken and Laura. 
So, um, good morning everyone. Hope everybody's doing well today. So, um, welcome to the AU's SIS building. So, it's fitting, it's fitting perfectly that we're presenting here today because um, ever since the President Eisenhower broke ground on the AU's SIS building, um, so um, his words of like, uh, especially its um, alumni, faculty, and students are trying to uh, of embody his charge to wage peace. So, and we believe this research could, um, and we believe, thank you, and we believe this research uh, reflected back to his message. So, um, so um, does anyone know what are those? Well, these are, yeah, exactly. These actually are the dates we are um, it's for like large amount of people in uh, Middle East and also like in the world are consuming for a really long time. And um, for, uh, for the long de decades that, um, especially for like the Israeli and Palestinian conflict is considered as one of the most com com complicated conflicts in the world. And as Eric has mentioned, uh, spoke a little bit about the history. And it is, um, I'm pretty sure all of you have already familiar with the context and the conflict at varying degrees. So um, it's actually very complex due to it has like different dimensions. It does not only have like the identity and the culture or religion topics in it, but also the thing I want to talk about is it, it involves environmental issues in it as well. Because environmental issues are actually cross the boundaries. And there are water scarcity problems, the food security, and sometimes, you know, like even climate change. And so, um, especially people who live at Western Bank, they're kind of um, having a huge problem for their livelihoods. And it's kind of, uh, and for those peace builders, for our practitioners, and for even our students, just keep asking us our, ourselves, can we actually do something? What should we do? And should we do it? So can we actually do something? The answer is definitely yes. So here involves our two partners. So we not only have a partner from Israel's side, the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies, but we also have another partner from the Palestinian side, the Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group. And started from 2008, they have been working with each other for about 10 years. And they, at first, they were just trying to stress, uh, trying to address the environmental problems like wastewater management. But after 10 years working with each other, they figured it is really important to scale this project out and to um, to just um, to increase the people's interaction and to increase the communication between the peoples at a grassroots level, and also try to seek the opportunities to um, contribute the contribute to the peace process in this region. So this is um, so the. Uh, Arava Institute is actually located at the uh, Arava Valley of this area. And the uh, Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group is located at the West, West Bank. So basically, Arava Institute works at the Arava Valley and the uh, Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Groups. Their uh, work of operation covers the uh, Jordan Valley here. So the project we're invited to study is called the Israeli-Palestinian Corporate Data Production and Management Project. And as you can tell from the name, it actually includes the people both from Israeli and Palestinian side and try to uh, strengthen the cooperation through the agricultural practice. So the, for the activities, they were having two components. The first one is the technical component. So they are trying to bring the tools and equipment to the people at the targeted areas. And not only about this, they're also trying to uh, increase the communication between the peoples. They're trying to arrange workshops and trainings um, so that people could interact with each other more often. And by providing this kind of activities, they're trying to reach the uh, outcome. So the, f the first one is try to increase the use of the uh, renewable energy. And in this case, that would be solar energy. And also, they're trying to improve the water access and availability. So by successfully addressing point one and point two, so um, they were hoping this agriculture development will be enhanced. And the most importantly, they were trying to strengthen the cooperation and the coexistence between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So this is where they're trying to contribute to the peace process in this region. So the project was first launched in Jericho, already circled this area. 
and in 2016. And the village we're receiving these activities is called the Oja. And in 2017, they're trying to scale out this project to Marsh or Gaza, which is considered, considered as one of the areas that has a poor risk to water access. So for the technical activities, so the first one they're trying to install the wastewater treatment plant. This is actually used at the household and neighborhood level by, um, by increasing the quality and both quantity of the uh, use, water use for people's everyday use. So um, they would be successfully uh, addressed. The, uh, it could also contribute to a small scale day farming. So they're also trying to install the photo uh, pho photovoltaic systems for the solar energy. And as you can tell, it's basically mainly sunny all the time. So there is a huge potential for solar energy use. And not only about this, and they're trying to increase the people-to-people -people, uh, interaction. So the first one, they're trying to establish a committee that has both Israelis and Palestinians. And the committee is called the Jordan Arab Valley Committee. And it all not only consists, consists of the farmers who are actually doing the agriculture practice, but also they're trying, uh, trying to include the technical experts and the decision makers and even the packers for the dates to um, join the committee and to talk about the current urgent issues in this area and even for this project. And they're also trying to arrange the workshops for the Palestinian farmers. They try to invite the Israeli farmers to the Western Bank um, to just like teach and sharing uh, knowledge and skills with the Palestinian farmers because the Israeli farmers is always normally considered to have, uh, to have more mature skills and knowledge at the date farming. So I will just stop here and my friend Mike will provide more details on the our research in, in relation to the project and also the Waterford Energy Nexus. Thank you. So our research focused specifically on the development and and peace building related motivations, expectations, concerns, threats, and aspirations of Israelis and Palestinians who cooperate in this water food energy nexus project. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization defines the water food energy nexus as the belief that water, food, and energy are inherently linked and that when actions in one area uh, more often have impacts in, uh, more often than not, have impacts in one or both of the others. Water, food, and energy all play important roles in human well being, poverty reduction, and sustainable development. The increasing demand of scarce water resources uh, from a growing population and a lack of renewable energy in the Middle East make understanding the synergies and constraints in how humans use and manage these resources critical to the well-being of millions. The West Bank provides a prime example of the interconnectedness uh, within the water, food, and energy sectors. For example, date farmers in the West Bank require access to energy in order to produce treated wastewater which irrigates their dates. Now, when one resource is unreliable or unavailable to the farmers, they face negative impacts on their livelihoods. Uh, in fact, when speaking with a number of farmers, uh, they, they mentioned in the Jordan Valley, they mentioned that inconsistent energy, water shortages, and poor water quality are all threats to their livelihoods. Both Israelis in the Arava Valley and Palestinians in the Jordan Valley face problems concerning water, food, and energy to varying extents. When speaking with both Israeli and Palestinian government officials, uh, they expressed concerns over water availability. A, re a retired Israeli government official uh, told us, Israel is a desert, we don't have enough water, and we will never have enough water for our needs. And when speaking with a Palestinian government official, he revealed since 1984, 
uh, or since, excuse me, since 1994, the Palestinian population has doubled, yet the water use uh, under the Oslo Accord remains the same. Farmers in Marj al Ghazal, the community we spent a lot of time in during our two weeks in uh, Israel and, the, uh, and, and Palestine, face similar issues. Mature date palms require between 300 and 700 liters of water per day, which is a figure far greater than the 167 liters that are available to farmers in that community. Now, the installment of the wastewater treatment plants, with ja, of which Jameta spoke about a little bit and are pictured here in the slide, has the ability to alleviate uh, this challenge by producing between 500 and 4,500 uh, liters of water per day. However, as we discussed in the water food energy nexus, increased water is going to call for uh, increased energy use as well. Now, luckily, the project sites we visited have great uh, solar energy potential. Uh, in the West Bank, uh, they receive 3,000 sunshine hours per year which is a, a number that is very similar to that of San Diego, California, which you always hear is, you know, sunny all, all year round. But on our site visits, we noticed there are currently only a few established solar electricity uh, systems benefiting our project stakeholders. The Arava Institute and PWEG, their experience in the region uniquely places both organizations in a position to promote cooperation around the water food energy nexus, which in itself is not necessarily unique, but is rare in the conflictual uh, Israeli-Palestinian Middle East. The methodology we developed allowed us to gain a better understanding of the common problems faced by the project stakeholders and our methodology uh, ensured we were able to uh, provide positive, our useful feedback and recommendations to our partner organizations. During the desk study and training portion of the practicum, which occurred before the field work, we studied the theory and practice of environmental peace building, learned about the challenges and opportunities associated with conducting research and evaluation in a conflict setting, and develop skills in rapid appraisal techniques. The desk study and trainings helped us develop our framework and come up with our semi-structured interview questions. The field work, the two-week field work we conducted was participatory in nature and yielded qualitative uh, data. And when we were in Israel and Palestine, we collected data four different ways. We uh, interviewed folks with semi-structured interviews. Uh, we uh, used participant observation. We uh, went to uh, and participated in different focus groups and a number of site visits. Throughout our two weeks in country, we conducted 22 semi-structured interviews with 31 participants. Uh, observing, we also observed a joint uh, project stakeholder meeting with 14 project participants and five project staff, and visited a number of different date farms in the Arava and Jordan Valleys. The interviews we conducted included a wide range of stakeholders, uh, such as Israeli and Palestinian date farmers, non-governmental organizations, and Israeli and Palestinian government officials. Now my colleague Milo is going to speak more in depth about our conceptual framework. Hi, everyone. So our conceptual framework um, was designed prior to our field work. And, it, and essentially, it's to guide our um, methodology section, as Mike has uh, talked about, and, uh, 
analysis uh, of the findings. Uh, prior to the field work, uh, besides rapid, you know, going over rapid appraisal approaches and uh, and uh, the overall context, we uh, focused on the theory, particularly uh, development and peace building theories, um, society versus leadership within peace building, and uh, water, food, energy nexus, and overall environmental uh, peace building. So since peace building uh, is considered as an extension uh, to conflict resolution, uh, the concept of uh, sustainable peace or sustaining peace can be brought in to reinforce um, conflict uh, prevention. The aim of peace building is uh, to remove causes of war and uh, offer alternatives uh, in situations where wars might uh, occur. One alternative on the rise is um, environmental peace building. And um, the boxes here uh, present uh, common arguments made by uh, scholars uh, in, in this field. Uh, in perspective, you know, why, why should we wait for um, environmental degradation to, to cause war? Rather, uh, environmental cooperation could lead to peace. And uh, if natural resources that are, um, that are essential to livelihoods are destroyed in conflict zone, uh, then uh, durable peace is least likely to occur. Therefore, environmental peace building is uh, the process of governing and managing uh, natural resources and, uh, and the environment to support uh, durable peace. This water, uh, food, energy uh, nexus project has peace building, has a peace building component, but it begins with environmental cooperation uh, as a way that can help mitigate uh, this conflict. However, as you saw in our research question, it is the development and peace building related perceptions uh, of the stakeholders that we are after during our field work. Uh, as a team, we agreed to collect perception data and, uh, and analyze the results in terms of the following four um, themes, which are identity, equity, trust, and uh, sustainability. Starting on the left, um, both Israeli and Palestinian identities continue to be shaped by the conflict, and both have ties to the land. Um, the concept of the other or the other side uh, occurs in this conflict and plays a key role. It is uh, the alienate, alienation of a uh, group that is not one's own for the purpose of creating a societal or cultural structures that exclude the other or the other side. Uh, characteristics of identity such as culture, interactions, experiences, are all continually evolving uh, and have potential in peace building to overcome barriers. Direct communication is vital in any um, cooperation and plays a major role in this project, which is the people-to-people -people component. Um, but there are communication differences as well. And these differences help us understand um, expectations, particularly when it comes to um, uh, in relation to scarcity. Lastly, with all things considered, uh, shared, a shared identity is inevitable in this conflict. Uh, but we focus mainly on the shared identity of uh, the stakeholders um, in this project. For equity, uh, we look into the uneven distribution of power uh, between both sides, uh, but, it's, but it is favored more by the Israeli side. Uh, and we're not necessarily talking about military power here. Uh, it is more the perceived control over the allocation of resources um, and the outcome of the other party. When Palestinians experience uh, inequities, it is because they do not enjoy the same resources and services that contribute to stability and advancement uh, that is experienced by the Israelis. In addition, ignoring the presence of inequality or uh, inequity uh, perpetuates systematically uh, asymmetrical policies and the actions toward the conflict, uh, towards one of the conflict parties. Both of these uh, act as a driver to, um, in the continuation of, of the conflict. Hence, uh, expressions and feelings of disempowerment or empowerment um, in this project helps us analyze um, and analyze attitudes and perceptions uh, of both sides. Um, for trust, to determine the level, type, 
and motive behind trust present in this cooperative. Our team focused on uh, the following indicators. Um, for, for perceived uh, communality, um, this gets back at the potential in, uh, in, in shared identity and, uh, and how it can strengthen uh, trust. Um, and we could start with farming or, or just be, being present in a conflict zone like this. Um, or for knowledge accuracy, you know, how much do the stakeholders really know about each other's farming techniques um, or being open to, you know, the other's technique or the marketing strategy? Or what about their livelihoods, how they live, you know, on their lands and, and, uh, and the overall cultural um, component of their, of their lives? Uh, the rest of the indicators are all, are all critical uh, uh, to evaluate in this project, um, particularly in the workshops, committee meetings, or any other joint activities to effectively measure uh, the level of trust. And our last theme is one of the two motives behind environmental peace building, um, and that is sustainability. Sustainability uh, in environmental peace building is defined as uh, the ability to maintain environmental quality, human rights, and equity among populations. However, since human rights and uh, equity are discussed in, in other parts of our framework, uh, the sustainability, for sustainability we approached, we approached it with an emphasis on quality and uh, its implication for cooperation. As Mike has mentioned uh, before, water is necessary for food um, and energy production. Energy is needed for food production and water supply and food production is a consumer of land, energy, and water. Uh, the indicators our team chose to um, evaluate are water quality and se uh, security and uh, energy uh, security. And for the next part, uh, my colleague Rita is going to uh, present uh, the team's critical insights. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. Um, so for the insights, I'll be speaking about the insights that we found um, within the research and context. So uh, for the first point, there is a lack of understanding and concern surrounding political instability. Palestinian farmers emphasize the lack of rights and political power as key concerns and threats, whereas only a few Israeli farmers and practitioners mentioned political instability as a secondary concern. Moreover, there were different interpretations of what political instability means and its implications. The Joint Water Committee and the Israeli Civil Administration Permit Regime and the region's political instability in general were primary concerns and threats for many Palestinian farmers. Furthermore, Palestinian farmers noted the lack of institutional power, resource restrictions, and little economic access as concerns with a high degree of importance. Israeli farmers, practitioners, and government officials only expressed concern around political instability with less importance after um, explaining more concerns like technical concerns like competition, um, climate change, and pests. This does bring up the issue of uh, normalization, which is defined as participation in any project or initiative or activity, local or international, specifically designed for gathering Palestinians and Israelis that does not explicitly aim to expose and resist the occupation and all forms of discrimination and oppression against the Palestinian people. Four Israeli stakeholders characterize the anti-normalization movement or the lack of cooperation between the two as a threat because of its negative impacts on cross-boundary cooperation and as a threat uh, because, of its negative, because of the negative impact on cross-boundary cooperation and also because of its negative impact on both Israelis and Palestinians. When Palestinians cited anti-normalization, they often focused on the legitimacy or reasoning behind it, emphasizing the movement's limitations and restrictions as an acceptable and necessary short-term consequence. The lack of a nuanced understanding of anti-normalization for project participants can have negative implications on the, this particular environmental cooperation project. The misperception of anti-normalization movement as an unnecessary burden can inadvertently and mistakenly delegitimize the project's cooperation efforts. 
without this understanding or acknowledgement of the historical context surrounding anti-normalizations. Israelis default to positions um, ostensible of political realities given the asymmetric power balance in their favor. This was evidenced in an interview with an Israeli who had declined an invitation to participate in the environmental cooperation project. The interviewee suggested that Palestinian farmers in the Jordan Valley work with settler farmers as opposed to their current project partners in the Araba Valley due to the geographic uh, proximity of the Palestinian Jordan Valley farmers to settler farmers. Um, if you remember from the initial map that John Mesa showed, uh, the Araba Valley is a few hours away from the Jordan Valley, and this was the reason for that statement. Um, however, this statement illustrates the lack of understanding of the Palestinian anti-normalization movement. For the next point, um, I'm going to talk about differences in orientation and business, cult and, uh, business and cultural contexts. Palestinian farmers tend to be collectivist in culture, but individualistic in farming and business practices. The farms run at the family level rather than the community level, and this puts them at a disadvantage because they do not have the same economic organization as Israelis. Israeli farmers have community-based farming and business practices in the form of um, a kibbutz or uh, plural kibbutzim, which are collective agricultural uh, communities. And they see this collective organiz organizing and culture as key to their success. Some Israelis attribute their success to Jewish cultural values around collective farming and resource sharing, while others attribute it to their business model. However, the larger issue regarding Palestinian farmers' ability to produce more dates is largely impacted by resource scarcity, which impacts their ability to make long-term strategy uh, strategies for resilience. Palestinian farmers see the abundant resources, technology, government support, and rights enjoyed by the Israeli farmers as major advantages and reasons for their success. For the next point, um, for the people-to-people -people interactions, the project is a significant space for these people-to-people -people interactions and demonstrates its ability to counter internalized and interpersonal inequities among both Israeli and part uh, Palestinian participants. The project developed experience and knowledge sharing structures and processes like joint workshops and the joint uh, Arava Valley, uh, Jordan Arava Valley Committee and uh, with both Israeli and Palestinian farmers. And the people to people aspect is a major component that aims to overcome contact barriers resulting from the conflict. Both Israeli and Palestinian participants noted people frequently resort to the mainstream discoursing of the other and depictions of the other identity as the enemy. Based on the interviews, the expectations of the people-to-people -people connections for Palestinian farmers were more pessimistic than the Israeli farmers, especially when considering some of the larger structural and institutional inequities. One Palestinian farmer stated that although he appreciated attending the Jordan Arava Valley Committee workshop at the Arava Institute in Israel, Witnessing the large solar farms and the constant reliable service that the Israelis experienced reminded him that the project still lacks the long-term influence over institutional and structural inequities. However, the person-to-person -person interactions at the personal level had the most significance to project participants. One committee member stated that this is peacemaking on a personal level demonstrating how these interactions motivated participants to aspire to peacemaking through individual actions. The last insight touches on the differing reasons for project participation. For Palestinian farmers, the reason for cooperation and also part of the project's success in scaling out from the village of Oja to the village of Marjal Gazelle was due to the increased willingness and participation of Palestinian date farmers. The tangible benefits that clearly improved the livelihoods of the beneficiaries in Oja motivated farmers in Marjal Ghazal to participate. Also, the Oja project allowed time for Palestinian beneficiaries to tell people about the use of gray water reuse and dispel any myths or religious taboos associated with using dirty water for agricultural purposes. The farmers were unaware that the gray water, which is wastewater that originates from uh, non-toilet fixtures, um, like bathroom sinks and laundry machines, is different from black water, which contains anything that goes down a toilet. Once farmers knew that the difference, uh, once they knew the difference between the gray and black water, they were able to participate without uh, conflicting any of the religious beliefs or cultural beliefs. 
To further prove this point, the Jordan Arab Valley Committee had both Israeli and Palestinian members who had not directly benefited from the project, but participated in meetings in hopes of future benefits. For Israeli farmers, motivations for participation were centered around personal ideology and shared identity. Personal ideology refers to the intangible benefits of personal satisfaction associated with working with the Palestinians and also charitable contributions. Israeli farmers expressed aspirations that their personal efforts would lead to a livelihood improvement for their Palestinian counterparts. One Israeli participant stated, in the field, we are all farmers. And with that, we will move on to the challenges um, with Maggie Burns. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to one of the challenges that we had as a research team and then to a few more challenges that we observed in the field. Uh, so unfortunately, due to lack of time and resources, we were not able to include a section on gender in peace building in the, our research. Um, the interview questions that we designed were not designed around gender relations or gender dynamics within like the JAV committee, um, and there were far few women interviewed than men. Uh, so as Rita mentioned, there are structural and institutional inequities. Uh, Palestinian farmers expressed expectations for the project uh, to continue its small-scale household and community impact, and Israeli farmers also wanted to promote knowledge sharing within the different communities. However, PWEG and the Arva Institute were aware that most of the cooperation was on individual farmer levels instead of addressing the big structural and institutional inequities that would actually address issues with access to water, uh, gender dynamics, uh, and trust building within all of these communities. Uh, we also found that there was a lack of shared language. People are speaking Hebrew and Arabic. Some speak English with each other, uh, but overall there is uh, that lack of shared language between the two groups. Uh, for the Jordan Arava Valley committee meetings, we noticed that uh, due to a need for translation, there was a lot of uh, time lost that could have been used for speaking more about farming, finding issues, uh, r solving problems instead of just solving the problem of translation. Um, we also found that there is an inequity of resources and it comes with the conflict. Uh, as Rita mentioned, um, the Israeli see the, uh, or the Palestinian see the abundance of resources and technology and government support as a huge advantage that the Israelis have. However, Israeli farmers actually attribute their success to uh, their culture and their Jewish identity, their uh, farming on kibbutzes, they're together, working together, and Palestinians are more individualistic. Uh, they're not working on kibbutzes or working together. Um, but the scarcity of resources could also be contributing to this issue. Uh, the Israelis experience such abundance of those same resources that they are able to organize together uh, in a way that brings them long-term success and gains. Um, so this asymmetry and access to resources that exists born out of the scarcity of resources, uh, and which is further complicated by the politics of the region, um, has continued to shape identities of each individual groups and informs their willingness to participate in these projects. Um, so until this uh, asymmetry is addressed and the misunderstanding is addressed, um, both sides will need to completely understand each other's identity and uh, with respect to scarcity as well in order to uh, work together and address their collective versus individ individualistic uh, personalities. Uh, we also found that the salt concentration of the soil is really high. Uh, the Palestinian farmers, practitioners, and USAID all express concerns with the quality of water being used for agriculture and uh, the amount of salt content within the soil from the untreated water. Uh, Israeli farmers did not express the same concerns towards their clean water. 
and uh, there was a divergence between Israeli and Palestinian farmers, and uh, it demonstrates how Palestinians can tangibly benefit from working with the Israeli farmers, whereas the Israeli uh, motivations were more ideological. They wanted to help the Palestinians. Uh, they really wouldn't get a tangible benefit out of it. Um, we also found that the cooperation could provide Palestinians with greater access to clean water from aquifers and Israeli desalination plants. Uh, if cooperation is not achieved, insufficient water quality could diminish the quality of dates over time and thereby negatively impacting the Palestinian livelihoods, their food security, and their economic gain. Uh, finally, we were told by the date farmers that they need uninterrupted access to clean water for their livelihoods, which seems obvious. But just prior to their date harvest, they actually need cleaner water than the treated wastewater. Uh, the, so the opportunity for expansion into Israeli desalination was expressed a lot uh, throughout our interviews. Um, so inconsistent access to clean water could present challenges to their livelihood protect, protection again. All right, so now uh, Anne is going to talk to you about further opportunities. So despite the wide-ranging obstacles, Palestinian and Israeli farmers have managed to come together to form a committee, regularly meet on the West Bank in the, and the Arava Valley, and collaborate to, improve, or to form relationships and improve livelihoods. Through these efforts, we have seen real peace-building potential through increased dialogue and stabilizing livelihoods and it has been through observing these interactions and speaking with these farmers and practitioners that we have seen opportunities for further collaboration. Before we even entered the field, we identified a shared identity of farming within the project. However, the nuance of this shared identity and an in-depth understanding was not discovered until we began speaking with Israeli and Palestinian farmers and spending time in their date fields. Moving beyond the historical conflict, these farmers believe that farming can be a means of cooperation today and into the future. The Israeli farmers in Arava Valley overwhelmingly refer to farming as a business, focused on increasing profits and producing quality products. However, Palestinian farmers' connection to the land goes well beyond date farming. One Palestinian farmer and village leader reflected on the symbolism of the olive tree as a symbol of peace and a native plant of Palestine. He expressed with frustration that when Israeli settler farmers entered the West Bank and began developing land, they uprooted these centuries-old olive trees, threatening both their symbolism and Palestinian identity. While conscious of the past, Palestinian farmers look forward to having conditions and relationships that will allow for continued cooperation with their Israeli neighbors for the sake of improving their livelihoods. During a group interview with Palestinian farmers, one farmer reminisced about growing bananas and other crops. However, it's not possible to grow these crops today due to a lack of clean water. Israeli farmers that we spoke with hope to continue to cooperate with Palestinian farmers in an effort to improve their farming capacity and live in harmony together. It is this shared identity of farming that has allowed different farmers in the West Bank, Israeli and Palestinian, to form relationships and interact informally through resource sharing, to collaborate on this project and to continue to collaborate into the future. While we found that Palestinian farmers have a strong desire for more knowledge on marketing, packing, and other forms of date production, there is difficulty in recruiting experienced Israeli farmers due to a fear of intergroup competition. Despite this obstacle, many Israeli farmers suggested that Palestinian farmers could improve their business operations expand production to incorporate options such as salon, which is a date syrup, 
and optimize their available resources more effectively. One possibility for a joint business venture included a suggestion by an Israeli practitioner related to a nutritional date bar made by both Israeli and Palestinian farmers. This would allow for joint marketing and cater to Israelis' desire for increased economic gains and Palestinians' desire for improved livelihoods through increased access to knowledge and resources. Through our fieldwork, we discovered the looming threat of pests, particularly the red palm weevil. The red palm weevil is considered to be one of the most damaging insect pests of palms in the world. Consequences include tree death and decreased tree vigor, and thus it is a threat to all date farmers. So far, the red palm weevil has entered northern Israel and the Jordan Valley. Israeli and Palestinian farmers and practitioners expressed concern over the spread of these pests, concern that they'll spread further into the Jordan Valley and enter the Arava Valley. Due to this concern, both Israelis and Palestinians suggested a localized pest management plan. Without a dual pest management plan in place, the further spread of the red palm weevil will continue, and both Israeli and Palestinian farmers will incur date tree damage and loss, and thus a loss in profits. The idea of a collaborative pest management plan even intrigued an Israeli practitioner who had expressed a disinterest in any current collaborative projects. The issue of pests was one of the very few issues identified by both Israelis and Palestinians, which highlights a very unique opportunity to collaborate based on a shared environmental concern. And next, Gloria will go over our recommendations. So given the present opportunities, our practicum group proposed 11 recommendations aim at solving two of our main obstacles, communication and a joint future strategy. For this reason, we have grouped our recommendations into two groups that are aimed at solving the goal or, excuse me for a moment, they're aimed at representing our main goals of increasing and improving communication and understanding among stakeholders and also developing an agreed upon strategy for future project endeavors. First, I'm gonna discuss the recommendations related to communication. Communication and understanding among stakeholders is critical to any joint project initiative. As Maggie stated earlier, within the work of the Palestinian Wastewater Engineering Group and the Arabah Institute, the stakeholders speak either Arabic, Hebrew, or English, but rarely ever all three. In this case, the lack of communication actually creates a barrier to the project's overall success. Of the seven recommendations in this group, I will highlight three of them. First off, we are proposing facilitating dialogue and activities that promote a deeper understanding of regional equalities facing Palestinians and other identities. This includes age, gender, and income. The understanding of one another's goals and the project will come about via facilitated discussions at workshops, JAV meetings, or sorry, joint meetings, and equity trainings. This would produce a deeper level of trust and equity that will better inform and influence the project's future steps. Another option is to increase vocational activities centered around the different experiences and expertise related to farming for the Palestinian and Israeli participants. Since there are differences in the business orientation between Palestinian and Israeli farmers, the stakeholders can host workshops to allow for broader dialogue beyond what occurs in the context of farming and harvesting. This also sets the foundation for better understanding each other's struggles and identities. Based off the comments made by our participants, we find it beneficial to hire a bilingual, meaning Arabic and Hebrew, agricultural consultant for Israeli and Palestinian farmers and beneficiaries. Joint meetings use technical agricultural terms that are often misinterpreted by the Israeli and Palestinian members. For instance, there was a misinterpretation of terms related to composting, fertilizer, as well as chemical use terminology. An agricultural consultant will also save time through proper interpretation 
and provide expert advice that could ensure that um, the entire agenda of a meeting is covered and time is allowed for joint work. The second group of recommendations is related to developing future strategies and projects. In the field, when we asked about the future of the project, there wasn't a clear consensus by our interviewees. We believe that the Palestinian Wastewater Engineering Group and Arabah will be able to more effectively improve cooperation through the promotion of local decentralized solutions that meet the water, energy, and economic needs of Palestinian and Israeli date farmers if all project stakeholders are on the same page regarding the future of the project. Of the five recommendations in this group, I will highlight two of them. As stated earlier by Anne, or pests are a huge problem, in particular the red weevil, to agricultural pursuits. For this reason, we find it necessary to develop a mutually beneficial pest management strategy to monitor and reduce the spread of red weevils on the date farms. The development of a cooperative pest management strategy would facilitate knowledge sharing on the problem of the red weevil, which is spreading again from northern Israel through the West Bank and eventually to the Araba Valley. This represents a critical example of how knowledge sharing and cooperation from Israelis will ultimately benefit both sides and provide an opportunity to facilitate and engage the Israeli and Palestinian farmers um, using their technical expertise to facilitate cooperation. Lastly, we suggest conducting an economic cost benefit analysis of forming Palestinian farming cooperatives. Many Palestinian date farmers that we interviewed mentioned the challenges of selling independently with less market access and a desire for date marketing cooperatives. An economic cost benefit analysis could provide a better sense of the outcomes and the processes that may be necessary. The project could approach this by leveraging the business expertise of the Israeli farmers in the project already. And I know Ken touched on this earlier, but I would like to one last time set an acknowledgement out to the Palestinian Wastewater Engineering Group, the Araba Valley, and of course, our wonderful partners, Munther Hyde and Clive Lipchin, for allowing the American University Practica Program to continue since 2013, and for um, coordinating our interviews and making an environmental cooperation for peace building project possible through their tireless work. We would like to thank everyone we interviewed for their candor about living in Palestine and Israel, as well as opening up their homes and businesses to us, feeding us, and showing us the utmost respect. Finally, thank you to Dr. Ken, or, yeah, Ken Konka and Eric Abdeball, I almost mixed your names up, I'm sorry, for your guidance and support throughout the project. You both represent the perfect blend of theory and practice, the unique styles that are thought-provoking, practical, and at least course inspirational. We would now like to open the floor for questions. So we have some time and we'd be happy to take uh, questions or observations uh, from the audience. We've got a couple of microphones. We're going to ask you to use the microphone because we are recording the event and to be able to pick up the audio. I'd also ask you to identify yourself briefly as you pose your question. I think what we will do is collect uh, one of the skills that you develop here is in how to field and answer questions and figure out who among the seven is actually going to answer the question. So I think what we'll do is we'll collect uh, three or four questions at a time turn it over to the team for some responses, multiple observations from the students, and we'll get through at least a few cycles of that. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll come to you at the microphone. Hello. Um, I'm Annalicia, and I'm in the IC program. Um, and I thought, First of all, this is an amazing project, and I think you guys did a wonderful job. Um, my question would be, I would be really interested to know a little bit about why you chose this practicum, because um, I know that this issue is an issue that so many people are so passionate about. And also, how did you navigate your own identities and your own um, peace-building work, um, kind of reflective practice within yourself in part of this project? <laughs> Take a couple more. Hi, Anne Dare, USAID. 
Um, I think you've shown up in the region at a time that is arguably incredibly difficult to be an American, talking about peace building between Israelis and Palestinians, and I wonder how um, that perhaps biased or challenged conversations with participants. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bridget Cooney and I actually participated in this practicum two years ago. I just wanna commend all of you for completing your uh, research and report. I know how much work goes into such an effort and a job well done to all of you. I really enjoyed the presentation and I can't wait to read your, your report. I am wondering if one, out of one of your recommendations that perhaps you didn't share, if it included a gender strategy so that you can have more data uh, moving forward. Hello, my name is Miriam. I'm from the GEP program. And my question was, um, did you manage to find other international NGOs working on similar projects? And were you able to interact with them and see what they have done? So why don't we go back to the team at this point and get some answers, and then we'll have time for another round of questions after that. So why don't we uh, go back to the team? Okay. <laughs> um, so to answer um, the first question on why I personally chose the project, I actually, um, I knew about this project before I even, this is really loud. I knew about this project before even coming to AU and I just thought it was just one of the coolest things that I had ever heard of. And I had hoped, I, I knew that it wasn't a guarantee, but I had hoped that it would still be available for, for me to participate in um, when, I, when I got it in. And fortunately it worked out because last year it was not available. Um, but yeah, uh, so that was, that was one of the reasons why I chose the project. And as far as navigating um, my personal identity, um, I, I didn't go into this with a whole lot of background on the, the conflict. I mean, I knew it existed, but I, I hadn't really done any, um, any substantive research around it. And so um, part of the navigation was just was really, it was just a, a learning process for me and, and just meeting people and understanding how they're living their lives in this, in this very um, complicated, protracted conflict. Um, so I just kind of went in with like an open with with an open mind with it, just with with the purpose of learning. Um, I chose this practicum because I'm in the global environmental policy program, but I'm also interested in kind of different things. I'm more interested in wildlife conservation, but I wanted to get out of my comfort zone. Uh, I had never done field work before. I didn't know, I hardly knew anything about the conflict. So it was a huge learning experience and I really appreciated the opportunity uh, to learn how to do field work, to talk to people in interviews and focus groups. Uh, so that's why I chose this and it was quite the learning experience. So um, for me to choose this practicum, it's because my research area is environmental peace building and water conflict. So um, this actually, well, it's perfect for me. And especially for like the peace building things, um, you have to go to the field and field work is super important for the peace building, students who study peace building. And also, I just also kept asking myself if peace building could work at the um, different places. And of course, I mean, sometimes, for example, like even in um, Sierra Leone and in Liberia, like the diamonds, that natural resources could um, contribute to the peace, peace process, but different um, places have different scenarios. So we're just trying to, trying to explore if there are other scenarios that could contribute to peace, yeah. I, I chose this practicum. Uh, well, we had options to choose practicums here in the in the United States, but I thought that was boring. Although they, you know, they were important subjects. Um, since this was a this is a very depressing conflict, I wanted to find uh, you know the hope that still exists in this conflict and what it means uh, towards peace. I wanted to see this with my own eyes how they cooperate, um, and this is why um, I applied for this practicum. 
And just reading, you know, theories and, you know, the news here in the States is different than just going there, seeing it, um, and getting that practical experience. That means a lot. It goes a long way. Um, but I just wanted to touch on the gender um, strategy uh, that you mentioned. So it wasn't completely excluded from our report. And if you read the report, you'll see there's a, there's a really nice analysis on, on some of the issues that arise or um, discrepancies that existed. Um, for instance, in the, you know, the committee that we were talking about, there's uh, female presence there, that are members of this committee. I mean, they might not be 50% um, of the committee, but one um, recommendation that we had is um, why not offer since, you know, uh, particularly on the Palestinian side, since they come from traditional cultures, why not offer um, joint membership for, um, you know, uh, females and males, for instance, uh, a father and his daughter, or um, uh, another female and her, and her sister, or her mother, or her brother, um, to take uh, the, the stress or the, the pressure that's, you know, there in the room when you're meeting with the other, or, or just meeting with other, you know, in a room full of men. Um, and, and another way to present it to gain more female uh, memberships to this committee or just as stakeholders is to um, emphasize the, the importance of what it means for a female to uh, be part of this committee or to have a voice, which is um, because in these meetings, they talk about some of the issues that are, that are at home, you know, relating to household, um, like biogas or, or wastewater or whatever, and they find solutions to this. This is what the cooperative is, uh, you know, for. So if there are issues that could be discussed and uh, will ultimately save you money and, and, you know, better your livelihood, then people are most likely to, you know, increase female participation and, and push for that participation. So when you read the report, you'll find more information on that. Yeah, it's a cross-cutting theme. A quick piece of historical context. The gender question has come up every year since we have been sending teams there. When, we, when the first team went uh, and they were working on the backyard water recycling project, there were no women involved whatsoever. The NGOs had no women on staff that were doing the site visits. All of the engagement would be with the male nominal head of household in these cases, and yet Palestinian women and girls are key beneficiaries of gray water recycling, and Palestinian women in the house are key gatekeepers for the efficacy of the project. And so every year our team has pushed on the gender question. It's been challenging for the partners and for the stakeholders and participants, but we've also seen some clear and tangible shifts. There are now uh, women involved in the project. There are now women on staff with the NGOs that are engaging uh, in, in certain kinds of conversations that are more com comfortably had in a, in a single gender uh, kind of setting. And so um, I wouldn't want the impression to be left that we just kind of set gender aside because it is uncomfortable uh, to talk about. Uh, I think there are insights around gender. There are obviously challenges around gender. There are also enormous opportunities, and that's the kind of structure we've tried to bring to it um, from the start. Any observations on the question about the challenges of showing up as an American, given some of the shifts in American foreign policy, and how that did or didn't intrude on the work you actually did? I, I certainly remember um, during interviews, people, uh, farmers, uh, bringing up the topic of, of politics uh, in, in the US and outright uh, asking us about what our political uh, uh, beliefs were, which you know isn't something I was necessarily uh, expecting. Um, when when we got there, I was you know thinking, oh, they'll see us as as these students. People are familiar with with the group, but uh, that I became very uh, kind of uh, yeah. You would hear that time and time again. You know, what are your political beliefs? Trump, these policies. Uh, we even had the opportunity. Uh, to speak and travel to sites with uh, gov U.S. government officials, and um, they, uh, some of the interviewees, spoke quite a bit about, uh, you know, whether or not uh, this project and, and funding were going to continue uh, with the state of, of politics currently here 
in, in the U.S. Also, um, during our time there, it was during the announcement that uh, the U.S. would be pulling funding from the Palestinian Authority. Um, so we definitely got some questions around that that were that were really difficult to answer. And you know, like Mike said, you know, we, we came into this thinking, oh, we're just students. You know, they're going to give us a break. But um, <laughs> that was not the case. You know, and, and they were and, and they were saying they're like, you know, you're, you're still people. There are people your age that are doing, you know just as much and, and, and sometimes like even a lot more and, and, and they were right. Um, so that was really an, an eye-opening experience to have um, kind of like the actions of our, our country and, and some of the, uh, the, the view of us as Americans kind of just put, put in front of us and we had to deal with those, those head on. And asking them about their uh, beliefs, you'd find out that they don't agree 100% with what their government is is doing and and that would be a nice transition into saying you know similar to yourself you know don't see me as the uh united states government i'm i'm like you we have our our separate beliefs so i think this is a good time to touch on the bias question i mean in short yes bias came up a lot not so much with the farmers we found the farmers to be a little bit more candid but the government officials from both sides definitely had their talking points and did not deviate from that. They would use any means necessary to try to get away from it, even if it was just sitting there like this. But, um, so to talk about American politics, actually unrelated to Trump, we actually had one official talk to us about California's water and refused to talk about how Israeli manages water because he was so upset by how California manages the water and tried to blame it on us. I mean, that didn't happen all the time, but there was definitely a lot of bias, and they would use any means necessary to keep to their talking point. We had one Palestinian who said, climate change doesn't exist because Israel is the cause of all of our problems. Israel is putting chemicals everywhere, and that's causing the birds to leave. I mean, it's humorous to say now, but, I mean, they really will not deviate from those talking points. And the one thing I would say is that um, our American identity, you know, we still got the hospitality that we were expecting or that I was expecting. Um, it was more than I expected. It was, yeah. it was awesome. It, it didn't, you know, they still opened their homes to us. And uh, if anything, the Palestinians saw this as a wonderful opportunity because they saw, uh, saw all of us as ambassadors and um, wanted to present, you know, their honest opinion on everything and had a feeling that when we come back here that we, we were going to present their views. Uh, and um, so they... they they didn't change. They, they were very uh, respectable um, and uh, very honest with, uh, with all their answers to uh, our questions. Before, uh, before we have another round of questions, I just want to say one thing that speaks to this issue, which is, um, you know, in the, in the literature on, on peace building generally and on development and um, interventions, you know, we're aware that, uh, you know, interventions military interventions, economic interventions, academic interventions, you know, students in a region um, conducting a study, all of these interventions um, are in fact part of the political economy of a conflict region. And you know, our students, I think, were also perceived as a resource. You know, this question of, you know, are we ambassadors, this question of what is the message you will convey, this, um, this how do you navigate you know, the Israeli and Palestinian discourses and where do they overlap and where are they separate? And how do you disentangle, um, you know, feeling like you're receiving information that is trying to um, uh, uh, shape, if you will, and tailor a message and one that is uh, trying to allow you to understand the complexities and nuances um, and challenges uh, in a region and trying to make sense of all of those um, different you know, approaches, the different messages you're receiving, how what they're trying to convey is situated within the aspirations and priorities of each one of the, uh, the stakeholders with whom the students engaged. And so it's really interesting and I think important not to lose track of you know, the fact that the students are a resource you know, that are in a political environment and that is, you know, and it's not necessarily a financial resource, but it's a discursive one. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that was something that 
you know, that we talked about along the way and that becomes an important part of, you know, thinking about in a reflexive way, who am I in this space, right? What do I um, bring to this space? What do I take away? What do I um, approach this space with? And what do I leave the space with? And all of those, I think, are, are very much a part of the conversation uh, and the ongoing one that, uh, you know, that, that the students have, this, that the report itself becomes in this space as part of that as well. Additional we, questions we or observations? Touch, there was one on last one question. question. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. Um, with, of course. Working with uh, different nonprofits in the area um, when, when we were over there. And, and we did get a chance to travel up to Tel Aviv and interview an employee from uh, EcoPeace, uh, which is a, a nonprofit that's doing some really interesting work with environmental peace building as well. So we certainly did uh, get to sit down and chat with, uh, with a few uh, nonprofits um, in, in the region that are doing great work with uh, environmental peace building. And I'd encourage so, people to take a look at the report. Um, you didn't really center it in your findings, but one of the things I think is strong about the work is it treats the project partners as stakeholders as well. You know, they aren't just, you know, uh, you know, they have their own interests, right? They're doing wonderful work, and we have great respect for them and a great working relationship with them. But they bring certain biases and orientations, and there's a lot of competition among NGOs for scarce funding and so on and so forth. And so one of the, one of the valuable uh, forms of insights is to look at the perceptions, attitudes, threats, et cetera, that not just the farmers bring to the table, but also the, the other kinds of project participants as well. And there's some good material in the report on that, so I'd encourage people to have a look. Um, let's take some more questions. <clears throat> Andreas Nirschbendi from Kogard School of Business. Uh, I have three questions for you. Uh, as somebody who is well aware of the dates, what kind of date is this? So if you can identify it, number one. Number two, uh, which is very interesting that you mentioned that the Arab model uh, or the Palestinian model is basically individualistic, which which uh, which is not uh, which is not uh, I would say it's not a very common uh, uh, description because the whole Arab model of cooperative in agriculture, all the way from Mauritania to Oman, it is always cooperative, and you can find them in Tunisia, Morocco, and so on. So I was a little bit surprised. Last but not least, uh, the concept of uh, uh, which you attracted my attention here, what happened to the 489 wells that disappeared since 1967? Thank you. Michael Brenner from the Center for Israel Studies. First of all, thank you all uh, so much. And of course, also Ken Konka and Eric Abud Paul for doing this. How many years now? Five. Five years in six years. Yeah, that's great. And we're really proud to be have a little part in that as a Center for Israel Studies. And also the way you present it, I think, was wonderful. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, I mean, you all had your certain opinions before you. I, I assume most of you, all of you have been, maybe what came the first time to the region. Um, after your experience there, are you less or more optimistic than before uh, as in terms of cooperation? And the second question is, um, as you think of your own future, do you think that this particular project will have influence in your own careers, in your lives, maybe this region as well? Are you planning already some kind of follow-up? And one particular question to Rita, uh, you said that you heard about it before. I'm just curious uh, how you heard about it and in what context. Okay, um, <coughs> I'll speak right into it. Okay. Yeah, uh, fantastic presentations, everyone. And um, obviously you learned so much from this experience. Uh, Eric was talking about how complex a situation you went into. And I always wonder in this kind of situation, who benefits more? Is it you guys who benefited from having all these insights and these opportunities? Or in some way, did the local, did the recipients have their lives change in some kind of positive way? And I wonder if you can imagine um, the extent to which this practicum actually changed the situation on the ground or not. 
Why don't we go back to the team? We'll have time for more questions, but that's a lot. So why don't we let the team process that and then we'll circle back to the audience. So the first question was what kind of dates? Uh, that definitely uh, the most straightforward answer uh, out of all the questions. And Medjool dates were the dates um, that, were, that were grown. So they were, they were fantastic. They're the best. They were so good. Um, so uh, for, your, for your second question, um, when I was talking about the differences in the, um, the business and cultural context, concerning mostly the farming practices, at least what we observed, um, when I mentioned they tend to be uh, collectivist in culture but individualistic in the farming practices, what we meant, or what, what I meant, or what we all meant by that, was that um, the farming fam it would it would be a, a collective of like one large family managing a date palm farm, um, but there would be several different farms in the area, and the farms would not all work together. And we made that observation in in contrast to the kibbutzim, which you know they they all work together, they share equipment, they all have shared marketing strategies, and um and that and that was where that that comment came from. Um, and then for me personally, how I, how I heard about the program, um, when I was applying to grad school, I had a whole, uh, had a whole process, an Excel sheet, what the different programs would offer me, what I could do um, for my thesis and those types of options. So I did a, a lot of research and um, because American University offered that practicum experience in lieu of a thesis, I thought that is going to set me up for success to have tangible practical practical skills that I can put on. I went out there, I did this, I did this research, this field work. Um, Cause, and, and not only did I find the work interesting itself, but I thought that it would set me up better in the future. So I can also say that I heard about this project before the practicum itself. I actually took a class here at American where I researched independently the history of agriculture and the history of actually um, you know, farmers cooperating together. So I knew coming into this that it already existed and it has existed. And actually being on the ground and seeing it made me actually more optimistic for the future at the farming level. As far as the government level, I would say I'm about the same. I kind of knew that they had their own biases. I wasn't expecting a big change to happen, nor was I expecting us to be the ones that solved the you know, problem on the ground. That would be amazing and we would all get Nobel Peace Prize, but that didn't happen. But I do think that they did benefit. Yes, we benefited, we got this knowledge, we can take this with us, we will all definitely have this influence our lives. But yes, I think they did benefit. I think the farmers do benefit from this program, maybe not just only from our year alone, but this practica in general has brought together these farmers through our partners and with the help and the research of these students, we are giving them recommendations that they are actually practically using. So I do think at a small scale we are helping. I think also one of the positives of having this relationship with Ken and Eric that have had they've had with the Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group and the Arava Institute is there is already a level of trust established there. So the um, Clive and Munther who were with each organization, they were with us on a lot of interviews, they were communicating with us and when we make our recommendations and produce our report, they're, they're very interested and they're very involved. And I think that that, like they want to be able to use our recommendations. They wanna see what insights and analysis that come out of it and we, they can continue this relationship where we are <coughs> making recommendations that'll impact how the farmers are working together or how they're communicating and that can make <coughs> positive changes. Uh, well, in terms of Judy's question, we're asking about um, if this kind of project could actually change the situation in the ground. I hope it could be, but it's actually, to me, well, my personal view is it's really um, hard to achieve, So The thing is, um, to, one thing I learned from is that environment peace building, somehow, it's vulnerable, one thing. But also, the thing is just like, we can see the optimistic, um, Part of it is that people to people component and people are trying to communicate with each other and they're trying to interact with each other and they're from, you know, like different um, places and also there are other international NGOs involved like Ecopeace and they're trying to bring people um, together to like 
let's say, to bring people, Palestinians and Israelis, to jump into the same water and to just like talk to people. And this grassroots level is um, really uh, powerful. But how to uh, change from the grassroots level to the higher level to generate the political will to cooperate is another question. Yeah. I just want to touch on Dr. Nagashvendi's question. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Good seeing you again. Um, in terms of uh, the cultural, individualistic, or collectivist, um, I'll just give you a few ex examples where we notice that it is individualistic in, in practice. And that is, um, we, one farmer particularly said, you know, it cost me this much to buy this machine. And my trees are over 10 feet tall, you know, to, to go up there and collect these dates. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy this, this machine. I can't afford this. When we go to the kibbutz, they got several machines. They're all contributing to buy them, um, and they share them. Another example is there's a packing house in Area A near uh, Al Oja and Marjal Ghazal that's only used three months of the year. Uh, the other months uh, is just empty. It, it's not being used by all the farmers. It, it's one Israeli farmer um, or stakeholder said, you know, they could do so much with this packing house. But they, you know, start to strategize and think of other ways to use it during these months um, so it's not just empty. Um, and go into the 400 wells that you're talking about, um, they're still there. Um, is there water there? I don't know. Um, the other issue is the permitting regime. Um, there's meters on them. Um, and some of these wells you have to dig way deeper now to collect this water and Unfortunately, even in Area A, um, the permitting regime has to be, you know, has has is authorized by Israel, the Israeli side. So if they if they don't have these permits to dig or extract water, then these wells are either useless or just you can't use them, essentially. So that's the issue. There's politics there, and uh, that goes back to the Oslo Accords and the agreements they struck, and uh, till this day, these issues are not solved. Are we ready for another round of questions? I think so. Okay, another round. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> Are we optimistic? <laughs> um, hi. Uh, hi, my name is Jose. Um, I work for Laura Cuddler. Um, I have a question. I have actually two questions. The first one is like, uh, probably you all know about like Aheta Mimi. Um, she's very, Aheta Mimi. Uh, she's very, well, she's very well known now because she was in prison for like six months uh, for um, doing something. Okay, whatever. The thing is that um, her community became really popular among the Palestinian media uh, because um, she lives in a very, very close community to a settlement in the West Bank. And the settlement basically forbid um, the community from having access to like a water spring. And that's how her, her, uh, her family became really popular in, in, in the West Bank. So do you think that by sharing, uh, for example, the settlements, by sharing the natural resource, resources that they have with the Palestinians might enhance the relationship um, between the Palestinians and the, and the Israeli who lives in settlements? Um, also, the other question is, um, um, Michael Ban and Milad were talking about, um, the, about the individualistic um, agricultural system that exists among Palestinians. Do you think that maybe creating an initiative between the Palestinians and the Israelis where they can, for example, share their knowledge and their um, abilities in, in, you know, when it comes to farming, for example, might enhance these this relations and actually help the Palestinians to develop, maybe not like a kibbutzim um, model, but like to enhance like their, their relations and, and the way of how Palestinians um, farm, for example. So, uh, Rita, you mentioned this, this quote from an Israeli farmer that said, um, on the farm, or in the field, we are all farmers. I really like that quote. In the best light, in the most optimistic way, that could be seen as sort of the, the recognition of the self and the other for the whole group, where by working side by side with someone on the other side, they come to see that, uh, that entire group as like unto themselves. 
And I think in the most pessimistic way, that could be seen as the people who join us in the farm are an exception to the rule, and they're like us, but we still don't get the others. I'm curious what you, what you as a group noticed as to how that might be interpreted. As a quick second question, Michael, you mentioned that the Oslo Accords, since, since Oslo, the Palestinian population has doubled, but the water supply has remained the same. In the Oslo Accords, did it mention water by like a certain measurement, like so many gallons? It would doing a percentage allow for an accord to stay relevant within the process of peace building? I'm curious as to your thoughts. Maybe one more and then we'll come back to the team and then we'll probably have time for possibly one more round. Okay, you said one more, but I have two, but the second one's really easy, I promise. My name is Jill Zwicker. Thank you guys for sharing your work and letting us benefit from all of your insights. This was really insightful because I know nothing about this region. But, um, and I think you guys have already talked uh, about this topic a bit, but I'm just curious, moving forward, I think you guys analyze this that three levels, like the individual level, the, the kibbutzim, the community and non-state actor level, and then the government level. So as we see all of these challenges kind of intensify in the future with climate change and just politically, which of those three levels do you see the most potential for water government governance efficiency? Do you, do you see it kind of remaining? I, what I drew from your presentation was that kind of the non-state actor, the community level, and the individual level seem to be the most promising. But do you think in the future these problems will escalate to the point where their efforts will kind of be null and governments will take over? And then my second question is much more basic. Why is the soil, the, the salt concentration in the soil there so high? That's it, thanks. All right, I'm gonna start off with the shared natural resource question. So actually, we had one Palestinian state that their Israeli settler neighbors shared seeds with them. So he went up, said, you know, I like your seeds, they're really great. They shared it, there was no problem. But after we asked that question, another Palestinian quickly said, no, 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 that never happened, and kind of shut the guy up. And I mean, that was just another instance of bias where they're trying to hide those little incidences. So they do exist. That sharing does exist. And if it were allowed and if it wasn't this you know, taboo for Palestinians and Israelis to share resources, we would see a lot of good things come out of it. Um, as far as creating an initiative to enhance the relationship, that I think was one of the main takeaways from our recommendations, is that we want them to come together on every form of knowledge sharing, be it farming techniques, or fertilizer marketing strategies, every single way to you know try to bring these two groups together. Um, yeah, I think Gloria touches on an important part um, of the natural resource sharing is it's the the normalization or the the anti normalization um, movement with and and really the the cooperation between farmers, Palestinian farmers in the Jordan Valley and the settler farmers um, would be in direct conflict to, to that movement. Um, so it's, it's really difficult for them to, to create these relationships around that with people who are, who are literally their neighbors in, in a formal capacity when, um, when, during, because of, because of anti-normalization. Um, as far as the, the question for, uh, you know, in, in the field, we're all farmers. So the, the context to that particular quote, it was at the, the Jordan Arab Valley Committee meeting, and it was um, actually one of the Israeli farmers that said it. And um, the reason they said that is because it, it actually had to do with um, a lot of the translation issues that were going on. So definitely, um, I know that they meant it specifically for that particular context, like we're all farmers. Um, does it have negative implications for, okay, I can relate with you as a farmer, but everybody else, I don't know. Um, maybe, but they were there, they showed up, and, I, I, don't, and I, I don't think that they were just there because they were only dealing with other people within the same field as them. I think that they genuinely wanted to help them as people, um, but, it has been more difficult getting Israeli farmers to participate in the project 
versus Palestinian farmers because for, for Palestinian farmers, the, the, the benefits are, are tangible. You're increasing your livelihood, you have or improving your livelihood, you have increased access to gray water that you can use to irrigate your your um, your palms. And for for Israeli participants, it was, you know, I feel better because I'm helping pal my Palestinian counterparts in this. So I, I, I don't know. Um, I, but I would hope so. To answer the question about the Oslo Accords and uh, water, um, yes, during uh, 1990, the 1994 uh, Accords, there was a specific amount of, of water that was agreed upon, uh, uh, mil, you know, million cubic meters. I do not uh, recall the exact uh, figure, but that number was agreed upon for the population in 1994 and there were going to be you know further talks uh, in the future 2000 in you know 2001 and uh, those those talks uh, broke down so that number was not updated uh. I was going to answer his second part of the question which is the the potential in this uh, cultural characteristics you know collective or individualistic um, so there was always this this question of, um, you know, the Israelis are bringing technical expertise to this. It's tangible effects for Palestinians. But what are the Palestinians bringing to the table? Um, and in fact, the Israelis answered that question. For us, you know, uh, one farmer and um, a project manager. And they said um, they're bringing courage to the table. And uh, one Palestinian, uh, one Israeli farmer said, you know, for me, yes, I live on a kibbutz, I, uh, I farm, I'm a farmer, but um, it, it's something that I have a set, a set number of hours that I do a day. But for the Palestinians, it's, it's their life. You know, being a farmer is 24-7. It plays a huge role, you know, after farming, after harvesting, they're sitting together, farmers, or in their house, they're talking about their day, and, it's, uh, and I want to live that. I want to learn from them how to be a farmer 24-7. And, it would, and how it plays a huge role in my identity. So that's what the Palestinians are bringing to the table. They could learn from each other. Um, but it, in, in these committee meetings, and this is where this discussion happened, um, one Israeli farmer said, you know, I don't want to just sit here and talk about the agenda. Let's go out in the field right now and start working together um, and learning from each other. Because she had something that she wanted to, you know, tell the Palestinian farmers on particular type of, you know, the offshoots of, the, of these trees, how to take them out, because she realized that the offshoots from the Palestinian trees, you know, for that farmer, they're, they're smaller than the ones she has in the kibbutz. She said, there's something wrong here, you know, it's either the way they're surrounding them or, you know, whatever it is. But she wanted to go out in the field and just show him um, how she handles this. So as long as there's more contact um, and more field work and less talking, um, you know, um, and plus politics, then eventually those barriers, identity barriers, um, are gonna collapse and you, you're gonna gain trust and uh, hold, hopefully at least the peace. Quick and observation on the settlement question. It's also important to keep in mind that the position of many of the organizations that they've adopted is that the settlements are illegal under international law and therefore they cannot work with them. And so if you were an, or an Israeli NGO, that's taking money from the European Union or that's working with Palestinian partners like PWEG to formally collaborate with the settlements, even if it's an obvious win-win situation like a public health problem around a polluted stream or something like that, it's a very provocative act. And so it's another way in which the larger structure of con the conflict and working in a conflict zone uh, constrains what the choices that different actors will make. So, while it's certainly the case that many Palestinians are very, very sensitive about the idea of working with and therefore normalizing and legitimizing the settlements, that's not the only factor uh, that's at work here. It's the positions of many of the uh, Israeli participants as well. They just, they won't go there. So that's a fact of life at the moment. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. So, and also just add another point to the question that to see if this initiative could enhance the relation between each other. So the first thing pop into my mind is that where is the founding? So during like the our field research and interview, 
we kind of like consistently hear that they're struggling, the NGOs, and they're struggling with the funding problems. And especially, um, I remember one of them, they're saying, so this project we studied, it's kind of like, it's a five years project, and but what will be after five years? Will this initiative still exist? And how, and where can they approach further for those foundings? And I also want to touch upon um, Jill's question, um, the uh, moving forward to see. Um, I definitely agree that community level is really powerful and we can see um, people are like talking to each other. They were saying they can be friends and they're trying to attend the funerals together. And, but the thing, um, I can give you like a on observation. So when uh, when we interviewed one of the uh, officials from the Israeli side, and when we asked a question that if the Palestinians, if you are willing to work with Palestinians, and she, this is my own observation, she suddenly changed her position from this to this. This means like very defensive in the psych in psychology. So, which means I, maybe she does not want to talk about it. So, the political will, as I mentioned before, it's still another question, yeah. Um, to kind of touch on that and what Gloria answered before, the very first question about natural resources sharing, um, it seems so simple because on the community level, so many people want to wage peace. They want to be together and to work together, but many of the Palestinians are worried about normalizing the occupation. Um, it could be very dangerous to them. So being very open about natural resources sharing could be very dangerous to a lot of families. Um, I'm going to address the uh, soil salinity. We have very basic information. It's very scientific. Uh, but <coughs> from what we understand, it's because they're below sea level. The Dead Sea's right there. The soil was already salty, uh, but especially for uh, the Palestinians and the wastewater, it's actually exacerbated by the wastewater because it's gray water. It's from the salts that are in soaps uh, can make that a lot worse. Um, so that's why it's a problem. Um, I, I, I'd like to just add, um, I'd like to just add something. When, when the cooperation, when our involvement, so American University's involvement became, um, when we started working with the Arva Institute and the Palestinian Wastewater Engineers Group, so they started working originally on these backyard um, wastewater, gray water treatment systems. And the way we positioned ourselves was that we were conducting environmental peace building assessments. And so looking at the environmental peace building dimension, but also looking at that cooperation and what is that cooperation and, and um, what do we have to say about it? And part of uh, the way in which we, we worked with them was to help them understand, you know, stepping back from the project a little bit. You know, when people work on a project, they see the project itself. Um, and we helped them sort of step back a little bit. And one of the ways in which we did that was to have them think about the discourse of scaling up. So what does it mean to scale up, right? If you're working on, you know, uh, installing these uh, gray water systems in people's backyards, scaling up can mean, well, instead of having two or three or five or 10, you can have 20 or 30 or 50. I and mean, that's one way to scale up. Or you can go from you know, doing it in someone's backyard to doing it at a community center. And so they explored that as well. But there are other kind of discourses, if you will, around what scaling means. And one of them was around scaling out. Right? and having them start thinking a little bit laterally about who are the other stakeholders in their communities that, uh, that are potentially you know, implicated, potentially can be impacted by and benefit from the type of work that you know, an environmental organization, the Israelis, and a, an engineering-based organization, right, a Palestinian wastewater engineers group, can do together. And you know, we sat on this jetty in a farmer's field as they started having these conversations and said, you know, part of the scaling idea is scaling out into these kind of lateral sectors of people and scaling out not just the systems, but scaling out the relationship, right? So how to develop that, you know, dimensions of that relationship. And essentially, and that's just one example, I think of what these studies do is they help um, inform different ways of thinking about you know, what the Israelis and Palestinians are doing together, 
what some of the challenges are, what are the opportunities that these students see from that vantage point, you know, and also, I mean, since we've been doing this now for a number of years, you know, we see the context, we see the challenges, you know, we meet with the representatives of the governorates and the water authorities and the NGOs and the community members who say things to us that are maybe a little bit difficult to say to other people. Um, and so that becomes part of, the, part of the conversation. And so helping them think a little bit about what are the challenges and the opportunities, and particularly thinking about the opportunities, I think is one of the things that, you know, that these reports and that these studies bring in terms of the, the discourse um, in the region. So we have the room for another eight minutes. And I know there's a lot more questions, but in the spirit of the project, I want to make sure that we allow some time for people-to-people -people communication. So I'd like to ask the team to stay put where you are, and I'd like to get the email address on the screen so that people who might like to get a copy of the report uh, may do so. And I think we'll, we'll end it now and just uh, in a moment have a round of applause for our team, but I would encourage people to, you know, approach the team, ask your questions, exchange email addresses, and so on. And also we have some food over here that will only go to waste if people don't eat it. So thank you all for coming, and thanks to our team for a really interesting presentation.